Hello everyone and welcome to a new read aloud series. In this new series we are going to be reading one of my personal favorites from when I was a fifth grader. It is Armstrong Sperry's Newbery Award winning Call It Courage. Now this is a much older book than you might be used to reading. This was actually written in 1940. So this book is nearly 81 years old at this point. And I'm not just saying that this was one of my favorite books when I was a fifth grader. I've actually got proof in my hands. This is my very book report from Mrs. Cheney's fifth grade class at Dixie B way back in 1992 where I had written a report on this story. Maybe towards the end I'll share some more of the details in there, but we don't want any spoilers, and there are some in that review. So this is definitely a book that's near and dear to my heart. I hope you enjoy it. It's a great story set in the Polynesian Islands, which are a few thousand miles south of where Hawaii is in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, some of the names you might be familiar with if you're a Disney fan, you're going to hear some names like Moana and Maui. But rather than the Disney characters, these were names that the Polynesians gave to some of their gods. Being polytheistic, they believed in many gods. And Moana was their sea god, and Maui was god of the fishermen. Now, that doesn't mean in the Disney story that Moana was really a goddess or anything like that. Far from it. She was just a regular girl that was curious about the ocean. But that's why Disney chose that name. Because in Polynesian culture, Moana being the name of their sea god, that name has a close connection to the sea, and so a character like the Disney princess Moana, being curious about the sea and always wanting to go there into the ocean, that makes sense with that connection to real Polynesian culture. So Armstrong Sperry throughout this story is going to give us some details about what their life was like. Also does just a wonderful job with descriptive language and painting a picture that helps us visualize what it might have really been like to be there as this story is playing out. So with our protagonist, whose name is Mafatu, a 15-year-old boy, let's see what goes on in this story. Call it courage. It happened many years ago, before the traders and missionaries first came into the South Seas, while the Polynesians were still great in numbers and fierce of heart. But even today, the people of Akeru sing this song in their chants and tell it over the evening fires. It is the story of Mafatu the boy who was afraid. They worshipped courage, those early Polynesians, the spirit which had urged them across the Pacific in their sailing canoes before the dawn of recorded history, not knowing where they were going nor caring what their fate might be, still sang its song of danger in their blood. There was only courage. A man who was afraid? What place had he in their midst? And the boy Mafatu, son of Tavana Nui, the great chief of Hikaru, had always been afraid. So the people drove him forth, not by violence, but by indifference. Mafatu went out alone to face the thing he feared the most. And the people of Hikaru still sing his story in their chants and tell it over the evening fires. It was the sea that Mafatu feared. He had been surrounded by it ever since he was born. The thunder of it filled his ears, the crash of it upon the reef, the mutter of it at sunset the threat and fury of its storms. On every hand, wherever he turned, the sea was there. He could not remember when the fear of it had first taken hold of him. Perhaps it was during the great hurricane which swept Hikaru when he was a child of three. Even now, twelve years later, Mafatu could remember that terrible morning. His mother had taken him out to the barrier reef to search for sea urchins in the reef pools. There were other canoes scattered at wide intervals along the reef. With late afternoon, the other fishermen began to turn back. They shouted warnings to Mafatu's mother. It was the season of hurricane, and the people of Hikaru were nervous and ill at ease, charged, it seemed, with an almost animal awareness of impending storm. But when at last Mafatu's mother turned back toward shore, a swift current had set in around the shoulder of the reef passage, a meeting of tides that swept like a mill race out into the open sea. It seized their frail craft in its swift race. Despite all the woman's skill, the canoe was carried on the crest of the churning tide through the reef passage into the outer ocean. Fatu would never forget the sound of his mother's despairing cry. He didn't know then exactly what it meant, but he felt that something was terribly wrong, and he set up a wailing. Night closed down upon them, swift as a frigate's wing, darkening the known world. The wind of the open ocean rushed in at them, screaming. 
Waves lifted and struck at one another, their crests hissing with spray. The poles of the outrigger were torn from their thwarts. The woman sprang forward to seize her child as the canoe capsized. The little boy gasped when the cold water struck him. He clung to his mother's neck. It was as if Moana the sea god was reaching up for them, seeking to draw them down into his dark heart of water. Off the tip of Hikaru lay the uninhabited islet of Takoto, shrouded in darkness. It was scarcely more than a ledge of coral, almost a wash. The swift current bore directly down upon the islet. Dawn found the woman still clinging to the Purao Po, and the little boy with his arms locked about his mother's neck. The grim light of day revealed sharks circling, circling. Little Mafatu buried his head against his mother's cold neck. He was filled with terror. He even forgot the thirst that burned in his throat. But the palms of Takoto beckoned with their promise of life, so the woman fought on. When at last they were cast up on the pinnacle of coral, Mafatu's mother crawled ashore with scarcely enough strength left to pull her child beyond the reach of the sea's hungry fingers. The little boy was too weak even to cry. At hand lay a cracked coconut. The woman managed to press the cool, sustaining meat to her child's lips just moments before she died. Sometimes even now in the hush of night, when the moon was full and its light lay in silver bands across the Pondanu mats, and all the village was sleeping, Mafatu would wake and sit upright. The sea muttered its eternal threat to the reef. The sea. And a terrible trembling seized the boy's limbs, while a cold sweat broke out on his forehead. Mafatu seemed to see again the faces of the fishermen who had found the dead mother and her whimpering child. These pictures still colored his dreams. And so it was that he shuddered when the mighty seas, gathering far out, hurled themselves at the barrier reef of Hikaru, and the whole island quivered under the assault. Perhaps that was the beginning of it. Mafatu, the boy who had been christened Stoutheart by his proud father, was afraid of the sea. What manner of fisherman would he grow up to be? How would he ever lead the men, of bat men in battle against warriors of other islands? Mafatu's father heard the whispers, and the man grew silent and grim. The older people of the tribe were not unkind to the boy, for they believed it was the fault of the Tupapo, the ghost spirit which possesses every child at birth. But the girls laughed at him, and the boys failed to include him in their games. And the voice of the reef seemed pitched for his ears alone. It seemed to say, You cheated me once, Mafatu, but someday, someday I will claim you. Mafatu's stepmother knew no sympathy for him and his stepbrothers treated him with open scorn. Listen, they would mock. Moana the sea god thunders on the reef. He is angry with us all because Mafatu is afraid. The boy learned to turn these jibes aside, but his father's silence shamed him. He tried with all his might to overcome his terror of the sea. Sometimes, stealing himself against it, he went with Tavana Nui and his stepbrothers out beyond the reef to fish. Out there where the glassy swells of the ocean lifted and dropped the small canoe, pictures crowded into the boy's mind, setting his scalp a tingle. Pictures of himself, merely a babe, clinging to his mother's back, sharks cruising around him. And so overcome would he be at the remembrance of that time that he would drop his spear overboard or let the line go slack at the wrong mo moment and lose the fish. It was obvious to everyone that Mafatu was useless upon the sea. He would never earn his proper place in the tribe. Stout heart. How bitter the name must taste upon his father's lips. So finally, he was not allowed to go forth with the fishermen. He brought ill luck. He had to stay at home making spears and nets, twisting coir, the husk of the coconut, into stout shark line for other boys to use. He became very skillful at these pursuits, but he hated them. His heart was like a stone in his chest. A nondescript yellow dog named Uri was Mafatu's inseparable companion. Uri with his thin coat which showed his ribs and his eyes so puzzled and true. He followed the boy wherever he went. Their only other friend was Kiwi, an albatross. The boy had once found the bird on his lonely wanderings. One of Kiwi's feet was smaller than the other. Perhaps because it was different from its kind, the older birds were heckling and pestering the fledgling. Something about that small bird trying to fight off its more powerful fellows touched the boy's heart. He picked it up and carried it home, caught fish for it in the shallows of the lagoon. 
The bird followed Mafatu and Uri about, limping on its one good leg. At length, when the young albatross learned to fly, it began to find its own food. In the air it achieved perfection, floating serenely against the sky, while Mafatu followed its effortless flight with envious eyes. If only he too could escape to some world far removed from Hikaru. And that will be our stopping place in this opening section of Call It Courage. Now, as far as where the plot is going to take us, the author gave us some hints on that first page, kind of like the hook of the story, just getting us interested and wanting to read more. When it said this story was about Mafatu, who faced his greatest fear. And then the rest of today's section went on to explain Mafatu's fear of the sea. And it, boy, after going, what, going through what he did at just three years old, losing his mother, surviving that hurricane out in the ocean, their canoe capsizing, it's understandable why he's afraid of the sea. But as the story goes on, we'll have to see what does Mafatu do to face that fear. Join us for part two of Call It Courage.